Hi, I'm Tom Payton, director and publisher of Trinity University Press. Welcome to a new segment in the Maverick Book Club, a monthly event series about all things Texas with a particular interest in our home city and region of San Antonio and South Central Texas. As a publisher, we feel responsibility to look, deep, to look deeply into our role in the community. And at TU Press, we are looking at our role as editors, content curators, debate facilitators, both locally and at large. We're a nonprofit mission-driven organization. And we're, like all organizations, are always evolving, honing our sensibility, questioning what we publish and what stages we set and what role we play, again, in our community. Tonight's program is important. We've received an incredible community response with uh, almost 200 people registered, and it is moving and humbling. Years ago, we published a book for San Antonio's tricentennial, 300th, edited by Claudia Aguera, the cultural historian for the city of San Antonio. It was a book of which we were very proud, in particular because it laid out the archipelago, if you will, of experience and history and perspective that contributes to what is such a unique national and internationally recognized character of San Antonio. The Maverick Book Club tonight is focused on black history in San Antonio. And we were delighted to invite several esteemed members of the community including several of the contributors to that book. First, let me point out that the book, if you have not gotten a copy already, is available at a special price, and there'll be a link shown during the program tonight. But turning to the program itself, we, of course, knew who better to invite to help facilitate the discussion than the editor of the book, our friend and colleague, Claudia Guerra. So with, with that, I'll stop, and thank you again for joining us. Please join me in welcoming Claudia who will introduce our other speakers this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. I am honored and humbled uh, to be in the presence of the great researchers, writers, and scholars that have assembled here tonight. And for those of you who are here to listen to them speak, um, and I'm going to moderate my best uh, to make sure we squeeze out as much information as we can in the short time we have. Uh, and I think that'll be part of what we realize is that there just isn't enough time to capture everything. Just like writing the book, uh, putting it together, there wasn't, there aren't enough pages to put it all together, to really capture all of the histories that we needed to. So I'm glad uh, and thankful to Trinity University Press for allowing us to continue this conversation and to hopefully bring more of these histories to light that have not been told uh, well enough. Before we go any further, I would like to uh, start with a land acknowledgement and an ancestral acknowledgement. This is something that we like to practice in San Antonio uh, because we do need to acknowledge that there were people here before us. And those are the histories that we are researching right now. So before, the very, before us, the very first people that were here were the Kawiltecans, uh, and most notably the Payayan tribes who named this place Yanawana. Um, and then it became San Antonio after the Spanish missionaries landed. Uh, but many of those original inhabitants still live here, their descendants are here, and they still refer to it as Yanawana, and I think it's important that we acknowledge that. I also want to recognize that some of those early ancestors did have Black heritage as well. And uh, before I do any uh, ancestral uh, acknowledgement, I'd like to know if any of our guest uh, speakers tonight would like to honor any ancestors. And I believe Deborah did. So Deborah, maybe we could start with you and then everyone can join after that. Hi, Claudia, thank you so much. Yes, I honor my mother, Eva Mae Green Williams. Thank you. Would any of our other speakers like to speak? Sure, Claudia, this is Everett. Um, I would like to honor my uh, grandfather, Briscoe Burnham. Mario? I'd like to, <clears throat> I'd like to honor my wife, <laughs> who uh, is 
persistent in uh, making sure that uh, I do a lot of this stuff and it was from the very beginning. Great. We're glad she's here to do that. Carrie. I'm not leaving anyone out. I honor my whole family. Yay. Yay. That's great. And, and I'd like to honor, uh, you know, I, I'm not of African American descent, and, and, but I would like to honor some of those people that I have been researching lately, and that includes the Southern family, um, Ella Austin, and a lot of the, the, the Black enclaves that Everett has really uh, brought to light, which are uh, need more research and which are helping me understand how San Antonio came to be the way it is now. So, um, so thank you all for all of the work that you have been uh, giving. Let's start to dig in. Uh, I'd like to set the stage by first asking uh, both Mario and Everett to give us uh, uh, some of the history, uh, uh, one of the histories that you would like to bring to light that maybe has been undertold. And if we could start with Mario. Okay, thank you very much, Claudia. Um, one of the things that I, I'll talk a little bit about the article that appeared in the, uh, the Tricentennial book. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that is never told or has not been told, and I uh, actually looked at the uh, Canary Islander Manifest, and you have to go to Austin to do that and look at the, uh, of how they described the original Canary Islanders. And um, they described them as having curly, kinky hair, uh, described them as dark complected and used and they actually used a, a racial term uh, uh, that they said they had blobber lips and <clears throat> blobber was the archaic pronunciation of blubber and and so you can find that uh, several places in the Canary Islander manifest well these blacks came from uh, the Canary Islands and of course there were three at least three wars that the Spaniards fought in the Canary Islands uh, against the local inhabitants. And of course, the local inhabitants lost. Uh, and they would then Christianize uh, and then came to San Antonio. And a large portion of them uh, were black Moors uh, from, from the Canary Islands uh, who had been Catholicized or Christianized and wound up because the Spanish had a system of segregation uh, called the Costa system. And anyone who was uh, dark. Uh, you could have been Native American as well. <clears throat> they were told that they had to reside on the eastern side of the San Antonio River. And so the river itself became the first borderline of segregation way before there were any railroad tracks or anything like that. The, the river itself was the border uh, line of, of segregation. So that, that's one thing. And of course, there's a lot of other stuff uh, in, as well. And <clears throat> people like to say that there weren't very many slaves in San Antonio or in Bear County, I beg to differ. Uh, <clears throat> there was some huge plantations along the Cibolo Creek. And as a matter of fact, I, I'm gonna be walking one of them uh, real soon. Uh, and, and as a result of them being so big, uh, San Antonio actually put a curfew into effect uh, in the 1850s uh, because of the large number of slaves that uh, were on the Western side of the, of the Cibolo Creek which was in Bear County uh, then, and, uh, and um, Black uh, Indians, Seminole Indians, who mm -hmm. had bowed to free slaves on these plantations, uh, actually caused a ruckus, whereas the county commissioners uh, put slave patrols in effect, uh, rang a bell every night that all Blacks had to be off the street um, at 9 or 9.30. And, and so this is some of the stuff that's been hidden and not talked about. And uh, so we need to look at a lot of this stuff. Thank you. And before I go too much further, I forgot to introduce everyone. So uh, Mario Salas was just speaking. He became an advocate for San Antonio Africans American community in the early 1970s and was a key member of local activist groups. He was elected to the City Council of San Antonio in 1997, where he served two full terms as a representative for District 2. And Everett Fly, who will be speaking next, received a 2014 National Humanities Medal for pres preserving the integrity of African American places and landmarks. He is a founding member of the San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum. And then I will introduce Carrie and Deborah as um, I ask them their questions. So Everett, would you like to share a piece of untold San Antonio history? Uh, sure, thank, thank you, Claudia, and uh, thank you, Mario, for for that part of the, the context. Um, some of you might know that uh, 
I've been researching uh, the history of African Americans in uh, ranching and uh, uh, the cattle business. And uh, we've discovered a number of uh, cattle brands um, in the Bear County Spanish archives. Uh, uh, one of the earliest uh, dates to 1852, uh, Samuel McCulloch, um, who was a free uh, man of mixed race. Uh, but we've also found a number of uh, uh, brands that were filed by uh, African-American women. And um, I just happen to have a, an enlargement of uh, one of those. This is the 1875 brand of Jane Warren. Uh, Jane owned 100 acres of land, a little bit more than 100 acres of land, north of what we now know as uh, Thousand Oaks. But recently, I came across a, a brand of an African-American woman who was free before 1865. Um, her name was Margaret Smith Demery. She was born about 1823. And she came to uh, Texas uh, right around 1835 from Louisiana with her family. And they actually petitioned the uh, Republic of Texas government after uh, the Battle of the Alamo to stay, to be able to stay in Texas as free people. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, so they, they did that and the Demery uh, family uh, became quite large. But Margaret filed her brand in 1856. And uh, it's one of those in the Bear County uh, Spanish archives and she and her family lived uh, in far South Bear County. Uh, so the cattle brands give us lots of clues. Uh, they tell us and show us that, that African-Americans lived in all parts of the county, uh, north, south, east, and west, and that they were um, early participants in um, what we all take a lot of pride in, uh, you know, cattle and ranching and uh, being cowboys. Thank you. And, and Everett, I think that's an important fact is you know, we tend to, you know, the world tends to think of Afro-American history, black history, beginning with slavery. And the truth is that there, there's a larger story that can begin even before that with people who were never enslaved. Um, and I'd like to encourage everyone to uh, put questions into the chat. Uh, I will highlight them as we go along and some of our panelists will be able to respond when they see them. Um, so please don't be shy about that. We want to have this be a real conversation that goes uh, around with everyone and not just uh, a question uh, as we're starting off. Um, Carrie. Um, so I'd like to talk to you as a writer about some of what we're hearing. Carrie Clack was a columnist for the San Antonio Express News from 1994 to 2011. In 2017, he was inducted into the Texas Institute of Letters. Uh, he has written a collection of his uh, articles, which was published by Trinity University Press, and he's also a contributor to the 300 um, anniversary book of San Antonio. And so Carrie, as a writer, you know, I think Mario and, and Everett have highlighted some of these stories that have not been told. As a writer, how have you tried to fill that gap in your writing and what sorts of obstacles and opportunities have, have you found? Um, well, first, thanks for, for you know, on this discussion and for having me here. Now, I wanna say I'm back at the San Antonio Express News since December. Um, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't start off, wasn't intentional like uh, Mario or Everett or you or, or, or Deborah um, writing a column and writing editorials for the newspaper. I wasn't necessarily thinking about writing history. I was writing about what I knew, what I grew up around, you know, growing up on the east side, growing up on Denver Heights. You, you brush up against history. I grew up across the street from Reverend Claude Black, um, lived across the street from a house that w was once owned by uh, the great jazz, jazz leader, Don, uh, uh, <laughs> Don Albert, where mm -hmm. Nat King Cole would visit. So my first barber was John Inman, who was a legendary uh, political organizer and activist. So when I would write about things that were happening on the east side or 
would interview people, I wasn't necessarily thinking that I was trying to write history. I was just trying to, to uh, tell stories and write some things that maybe wouldn't be in the newspaper if I wasn't there and if I wasn't writing, if I didn't know a little bit about them. Mm -hmm. And whatever obstacles I had, I, I would put on myself. I think that in, in not taking greater advantage of talking to folks when they mm -hmm. were still living. I mean, I, I learned a lot from Reverend Black. I learned a lot from, from A.C. Sutton, from Roy Maverick Jr. But as I get older, I realize that there's, and this goes with family also, there's so many things that I should have asked. I should have been more inquisitive, and mm -hmm. I wasn't. Uh, now I wish there was the museum was there then. Uh, mm -hmm. I wish I, I, Everett was doing what he was doing. I knew Everett was doing what he was doing. Uh, you know, you know, 20 years ago when I started the paper. Mm -hmm. Mario, I've always learned from uh, history from his from his various columns in in the Black Press. So I did take advantage of of, of some of Mario's learning, but uh, my great regret is just not taking advantage of the resources which I, I had back then and and don't have available to me now. But I'm inspired by all of you here because of what you continue to to uncover and, and to teach me and everyone else. I think that that's great. I think part of what you're pointing out um, and something that I've learned as I work with communities is that there's there's cultural traditions uh, of orality. You know, there are cultures that talk and, and have stories that are handed down through you know, telling um, from generation to generation. And what has gone undocumented in the written form tends to be those cultures that are orally uh, geared. And whether that's because of access to being able to, to research, to write, to publish, or if it's really about the way we like to hand down these histories is, is something that I'd like to explore. And, and so I wanna bring Deborah into this conversation. Um, Deborah is the executive director of the uh, San Antonio African American Archive Community Museum, uh, which I agree, Carrie, it, it's, it's a great um, new place, which was co-founded by Everett. And if you could talk a little bit about the museum and address this idea of community and the telling of stories and how different research and, and documentation might be done and how innovative it might be and, and what you're doing right now. Thank you, Claudia. And um, kudos to my fellow panelists. It's an honor to be here to talk about our history and it's an honor to serve the community as the executive director of SACAM and entrusting me with uh, participating and telling the story of African Americans here in San Antonio. So what SACAM is doing, we are working diligently to collect those oral stories. And it's interesting right now because of the pandemic and the people that we want to collect those stories from are uh, are at risk people so we are engaging family members neighbors and friends to help us tell the story right now on our website saycam.org you can uh, upload photos uh, you can take the pictures with your cell phone as, uh, you know, you think back eight years ago, who would have thought, right, that a cell phone would have a greater resolution than some of our cameras. You can record those stories. Like you said, Claudia, it's those traditions, it's the cultures that is lost. And when you are not the writer of your story, it is now dependent on whoever has the pen to share it, which is why there's so many fairy tales. Mm -hmm. if, um, if I want to come from a place of conquering, then I will write that I am the conqueror. So at SACAM, we made an opportunity, created an opportunity 
for people to share their stories with us on our website. We have a way also where you can contact us and we can coach you through that uh, to help. We do have digital exhibits online where we're able to share the stories. Right now we have 10 digital exhibits on our website. We have a number, I believe it's 20 research papers from students that participated in the methods of his um, the methods of historical research, which is a class that Everett helped to create at the Texas A&M San Antonio. So those research papers are on there and a place to tell the story. But it's not just with us, and this is what I want to um, share, that even if you don't take the time to put your story in our archive, we beg you to tell your story, tell it, collect those stories. Like Carrie was saying, we had the um, Negro Baseball League virtual discussion in June and talking to those men, they said they didn't know that they were his, historic. They were just doing what they love. And so often we don't recognize that what we're doing is historic because we're just doing what comes natural. We're just doing what we love. So let us help you capture your story. That's great, Deborah. And, and um, there are a couple of questions that are popping up in the chat that I'd like to, to pose first to you and then open it up to um, the rest of the panelists as well. So Lubita asked, um, first of all, there's a lot of thanks and kudos coming through. Uh, so let me thank you all for, for speaking up. Um, but Lubita Gonzalez asked um, about the visibility of African-American history in museums. So you know, and I've thought about this. I'm so glad that the community archive has been created because um, as Deborah, as you said, the community is telling their own story. At the same time, we, we wish, and Lubita writes, that we wish more museums in San Antonio would center African-American history and Mexican history. Some of our museums only center on the white or the colonizer story. So what more can we do to correct institutional raci racism in museums that are perpetuating this myopic story? And, and how can we amplify and elevate uh, the diverse, rich histories that we have? Um, I, I do have a response. We're working with the Texas, Associ Texas uh, Association of Museums, who will be coming to San Antonio in April. And one of the things that we just talked about two weeks ago is the theme. Our country is seeing a shift in focusing on what is real. And so one of the things that we are calling museums to do is to do just that. And the museums that are responsible for hosting that event which there are 27 cultural institutions here in San Antonio that are working on the event, all agreed. And actually the theme was changed to reflect how we will start to tell the stories that are true and we will hold each other accountable for that. So Lupita, we're working on it and we're working on it diligently. And uh, Mario, you bring up the idea that this really needs to be taught in schools, and I know Everett has is, uh, some work done on that way as well, but Mario, if you could talk a little bit about um, education, and then Everett, if you don't mind following up on what Mario says, it'd be great. Yeah, we, <clears throat> thank you, Claudia. We just, uh, uh, recently, we just, back in January, we just, uh, we petitioned uh, the State Board of Education to include African American studies to high school students. And much of what we're talking about today, we were able to include that in the curriculum. Uh, I was glad to be on that committee that actually wrote up the, the curriculum. And uh, we just got through training at UTSA about 100 teachers from SAISD and Judson on how to teach the curriculum that, uh, that we developed. And so much of what we're talking about uh, right now will, will be in that curriculum. So I'm, I'm very happy that that happened. And it wasn't, you know, easy to do, but the, the State Board of Education, it was a unanimous vote. Uh, they passed it, so it looked like the first school, uh, two school districts out of the box, and of course, we depending on the pandemic and all that other stuff, 
um, who will be SAISD and uh, Judson that uh, enthusiastically agree to have um, their teachers uh, that are being trained uh, to actually teach the class. So we'll get a chance to pass on to our young people something that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, and I agree with the lady who said the, the, the history of the colonizer. We've had so much of that throughout our entire lives that a change is uh, going to come as the song goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This does seem a moment in time where that opportunity is, is can be capitalized on. That may have been harder. Um, that's why it's taken so long in the past. Um, Everett, do you have a follow-up? Uh, sure. The One of the things that I encourage uh, uh, just families and uh, individuals is to uh, and look at their history as uh, that it, it is important. Uh, too often in the past, we've uh, we've uh, taken the approach that uh, you know it has to be this huge heroic act uh, in order to be important. And uh, one of the things that we've learned in doing the uh, the oral histories as well as the archival work um, is that collective like family histories are really important. We've had some uh, families come in with some amazing, uh, sometimes it's only one or two photographs, but if you look carefully at the photographs and talk to the family and get the background, um, you realize that they were, they were uh, very civically engaged, very civically active, and um, all of those seemingly little tasks or pieces of history have added up to uh, you know, make something significant. So, uh, what I would say is, is don't think that, you know, if you don't have a big um, heroic name or heroic history, don't think that it's not important. When you start to connect the dots, uh, that's been one of the most important things that we found is when you start to connect the dots, the stories, the collective stories get to be just as big as, uh, you know, kind of the traditional or, or classic histories. Mm -hmm. And Everett, I've been at a couple of presentations you've made where family members are that, that you're talking about are in the audience. And I recall them, each one saying they didn't realize their history was important, that it's something that they're right. coming. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think part of that is because so many things have disappeared. Uh, so many things are gone. So a lot of the material culture of African American history in San Antonio is, is not always visible. It's not always tangible. And so it does exist in people's homes. It is in those photographs, it is in those letters, it is in those stories. Um, but we are slowly uncovering some of that history. So uh, when I think about, uh, and maybe not all of our audience has heard this, but um, the St. James AME Church, which is one of the oldest churches in San Antonio, one of the two oldest churches in San Antonio. Um, as we have been working on San Pedro Creek, we have located the foundation for the St. James AME. And, um, and how we take care of that, how we treat it, and, and the problems that it, it's going to incur because it's right in the middle of a redevelopment. It is bringing to light that in the past, so many of these places that existed have just disappeared because maybe they weren't as valued or didn't have the same sort of, of ability to tell a story. So when we are finding these things, um, for anyone, this is, I open this up to any of you, what do you think is a way to make sure we're protecting the, the last remnants of material culture that we are finding? How, you know, do they belong in a museum? Do they belong in place? Do they, what kind of interpretation do you think we need to be doing? And I may just feel this to someone. Mario, I, I'm gonna look at you, Mario, because I also know of a project Mario's working on, and that is to record uh, the histories of some places that have disappeared on the east side. And then Carrie, I wanna bring this back to you uh, after. Um, Mario. <clears throat> one thing that I'm working on with one of the uh, city boards is the creation of monuments and um, we're going to actually fund about five of them that will be put in different places. One of them will be, um, uh, and actually one of them I helped, uh, two people helped me to write it was uh, Charles Williams, uh, who's very active on the east side, and Aubrey Lewis, 
who is the president of the Denver Heights Neighborhood Association, we actually wrote one that's going to go in front of where Dr. Preacher's office used to be on Commerce Street. Um, so we got one there. We got one going over by the Vidora, which used to be where the black newspaper, The Inquirer, was located. And uh, we had to go back and look at some real old maps to find that location on Center Street. Uh, and then a couple of others. I think we're going to, we're actually doing a fist, and I mean like this, you know, about five feet tall, uh, over in the Denver Heights where the Schnick office used to be. Uh, and we've got a sculptor working on that. So that's one way uh, to, to try and save things because as neighborhoods become gentrified, uh, the popular, the demographic changes, then people who are moving into to these neighborhoods will never know that took place unless we leave some sort of presence. And mm -hmm. one way to do that is with historical markers. So I've got five coming up. Uh, they'll, they'll be funded uh, sometime this month and then another 15 coming up after that. So we're doing quite a few of them uh, mm -hmm. as we were able to get the city to allocate the dollars uh, to do that. That's one way. And the other way is I'm going to contribute to the, uh, uh, Deborah, I'm going to contribute to, a, uh, I got a, a notice to do a, I guess a verbal thing over there and, uh, and, and donate some documents that I have um, from, from the, uh, that I have been donating to uh, UTSA. And a lot of my personal archives are in the UTSA John Peace Library. But I have others that I haven't sent over there yet, and I'd be glad to send them over your way. Uh, as time goes on, old newspapers, all, a bunch of different things. Uh, and that's, that's, there are several ways to do it. And that's certainly one way or two ways or three ways. Carrie, you, you've certainly seen the city change a lot. And that's some of what you've documented. Um, do you have recommendations on ways that we can retain uh, this culture and especially the material culture that, that is still here, that maybe is not as valued as we think it should be? Well, I, 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 I do believe that that's, that's, that's the, the purpose of, of, mu of museums. And uh, I think one of the problems that, that, that many families, many people have is they, they, they have, I think as Everett was saying, it, it's, they have, may have things that they don't consider uh, big, that's a major part of history, but it's those smaller parts of history, those smaller smaller artifacts, those small those small family stories. I mean, there's a it's the difference between the you know the mountaintop history and the uh, you know the valley people history. And most of our histories, most of us are valley people. We're not on the mountaintop, and that's it's the accumulation of those those valley people stories and those valley people histories and those valley people artifacts that we that we preserve them and uh any way that we can find to have people actually go through their garages look under their beds look in closets to find stuff that looks old they may not know what it is but it just might look like it might be historic and there could be like a clearing out like say cam where people can take it to and the pictures or artifacts. I just, you know, the purpose of a museum is to preserve things like that. And we don't want them to, to disappear in someone's house. My, my great grandfather owned a, a, a black baseball team here, the South Texas, in the South Texas Negro League, the San Antonio Black Missions. And mm -hmm. we once had a copy of, of the bill of sales in our family and we can't find it anymore. It's probably been thrown away. And that's not a big thing, but for me personally, uh, I would I would love to have it, and I, it was something if I had, I would make a copy of it and give it to Sacam. But it's it's things like that that we have to make sure aren't thrown out. Yeah, if I if I could, uh, Claudia, you know, I like Carrie's comment about the big stuff, the, the mountaintop stuff, and the lower lower stuff. Uh, as high school students testifying before the state board of education, I never forget what one of them said. And I think he was an eleventh or twelfth grader. He said. Uh, and he said it with all due respect. He said, with all due respect to Martin Luther King, I'm sick and tired of hearing about Martin Luther King. We have so many other heroes that are never talked about. Mm -hmm. It's like we want to talk about the ones that maybe um, the colonizers are not that uh, happy about, like Nat Turner or like Denmark yeah. Vinci or, or like, uh, <clears throat> or, or, you know, David Walker. 
Um, mm -hmm. And so we actually were able to get some of those put in the, in the curriculum. And his, his point was well taken. We, uh, we know all about Martin Luther King was a great man. And that's pretty much the way he said it, 12th grader. He said, I love Martin Luther King, but I'm tired of the school system feeding me only one person like nobody else ever existed that made contributions, but that is being ignored. Yeah. And I think, go ahead, Carrie, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I was just thinking, I, I mentioned John Inman earlier. I think to me, one of the great tragedies is that we weren't able to preserve, it, I don't think it, it was even thought about trying to, to preserve Mr. Inman's barbershop on Hackberry. I mean, if you want to talk about a place where so much was going on and so much planning was going on, where you had the Bellingers and the Suttons and the Clark Blacks and everybody uh, coming together to plan and organize, Emerton and Yucca, I mean, he would open his, his barbershop to that. The fact that that wasn't saved on, on Hackberry Street is, is something we can never recapture. Exactly. And, and I think that's part of, of what I'm concerned about is the loss of material culture so we can retain the, the history and, and we can put up a marker and we should be putting up markers, but we also want to make sure that the marker doesn't uh, become a way to demolish something that maybe needs to be saved. And so I, I am thankful to the work that all of you are doing to highlight these places because I think it, it builds the awareness and the value of that. Deborah? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. I just wanted to uh, add this. I saw a question. So mm -hmm. if people are wondering where our, our, our archives are going, the library at the Texas A&M San Antonio will house the SACAM archive into forever. So we're very excited about that being a part of the digital collection. It will be the SACAM collection at the Library of Texas A&M San Antonio. So it's here. Uh, when SACAM first started, it was started with a grant from the Southern Historical Collection of the University of North Carolina that Everett uh, was extremely instrumental in capturing. Well, again, through Everett's work, that archive is now at the, uh, is moving to Texas and um, San Antonio. So we're excited about it, about that. That's great. Everett, were you going to chime in on something? Uh, sure, I, I was just gonna re remind folks that um, a, a lot of times we, we give up on the uh, material culture. We say, well, I, it's not obvious, I can't see it right, right now, but uh, one of the things that I like, uh, really love about living in San Antonio is the uh, the way the city has evolved, um, there are all these these uh, physical layers, and so archaeology plays a, a big role in um, in us being able to trace back. And then the um, the different uh, repositories that we have here um, uh, again have land records uh, going back to, as Mario pointed out, the you know the days of the, the Canary Islanders and Spanish colonial period. Um, so we actually have uh, ways that uh, you can trace, uh, you know, where some of these things were, even though they they physically don't rise up above the surface. And and again, the the St. James uh, uh, Foundation discovery is is a is a perfect example of that. Um, so uh, I often use the term uh, in my talks about what I call cultural landscapes. And um, I've had um, actually great fun here in San Antonio uh, looking at all those uh, layers from the indigenous uh, uh, population, the Hispanic, the, the European settlers, and lo and behold, the African Americans are embedded in those layers. Uh, so don't give up. If you can't see something on the surface, don't give up on us in San Antonio. We have this, this really amazing, um, uh, kind of archaeological uh, layer. And um, as some of you know, we've been uh, recently uh, uncovering uh, cemeteries. And in many cases for the African-American communities, uh, especially the settlements, as, as I call them, that, that encircle the city, uh, the cemeteries are, are the last physical uh, uh, remnant or evidence uh, of that settlement. 
And again, the, the, there's opportunities with all the records we have and uh, oral history, you can work backwards. We have several, several families that we've worked with and uh, uh, continue to work with to recover those cemeteries. I, I wanna address some of the questions that are being asked in the chat before we get too much further. Um, for the question about will there be public review for the, the markers, yes. Um, those will be required to come to the Historic Design and Review Commission. And that is the, the point where public can give input. I do know that SAGE, uh, the Eastside Community Organization, conducted some public events, um, I guess last year, to gather some of the ideas for some of the, the topics for the markers. Um, these are things though that are always ongoing. So if some of these markers do not capture topics that people have, we encourage that you submit those to the Office of Historic Preservation because those are um, topics that we can look at. Uh, and they're, that fact, that office, that is the office that I work in, we are creating a program called uh, the Alternate History Markers. And this is to create markers for those places that typically do not get recognized by the Texas Historic Commission, for instance. Uh, and we are just getting started on that. And SACAM is, is one of the organizations that will help us identify those. Um, Mario, there was a question for you uh, regarding re uh, research that you were doing about the SNCC in the 50s and 60s and people asking whether that's accessible. Yeah, well, part, part of that is at the UTSA John Peace Library in, in my historical archives. Also, in the thesis I did for UTSA, some of that is there in, in, in that book. That's at the, at the John Peace Library as well. Uh, and gosh, there's just so much to tell uh, about that and the relationship between the community and SNCC and the reason why the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee existed here in San Antonio had to do with Black Lives Matter, uh, simply because it was the result of a police abuse case, um, a very famous one, Bobby Joe Phillips, which is the reason why the SNCC organization was organized here to begin with. But you can find some of that stuff at UTSA's John Peace Library. Uh, some of it you can find in a book that I wrote, um, Texas and Amer American and Texas Political History, uh, A Maze of Racialized Thought in America. Uh, you can get that from Cynthia, Cynthia Publishing uh, and, and some other things too. But th and there's a lot yet to be done on that. Um, and I'm working on more of it. So I got more to come. Great. Thank you. Um, and people are uh, just want to give you kudos and applauding all the work that you're doing. So I just want to keep reiterating that those continue to come in. Uh, I also had a question from Mark Molina, who I see is on and has, uh, is one of those people applauding your work. Um, he had earlier asked, how can we show solidarity and support for Black history generally? What are some of the things that people can do to, to help promote this and support you? Well, I'll take a stab real quick. One, one thing I do is I have a weekly column in one of the black newspapers, the Century Observer. And that, what I do is I like to do like a people's history kind of rendition of um, some historical stuff. And so I kind of, I, I tone it down. So it's just for the normal reader, um, Howard Zinn style, if you will, of people's history of, of, um, of, in this case, black history so that people can see that. So I do that every week in the San Antonio Observer and, and other places as well. Um, so that's one way to do it is to <clears throat> make contributions to, to the black press and to black media. Also, um, I, I usually do some history on KROE radio on Saturday mornings, um, although I haven't been in the studio in a while. <laughs> I usually do that on Saturday mornings around 10 o'clock on uh, KROV uh, Internet. It's an internet radio station, and uh, and that's one way to do it. And of course, uh, <clears throat> anytime you get an invitation to publicly speak somewhere, uh, that needs to happen. And also, um, any any Zoom meetings. I'm, like I said earlier, I'm zoomed out by now, but I'm, I'm doing another Zoom with uh, Deborah, by the way, and she might want to talk about that, and because she's got some other panelists coming on too. But 
we need to use social media as much as possible to make a long story short because there are so many young people that need to hear this stuff that are really tied in to social, social media. So that's got to be a venue that we got to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. Everett, did you have some ideas? Uh, sure, sure. The, uh, again, the, it's been another education for me to get to work on uh, this research. And uh, uh, every day I find another, another account or another documentation of, uh, again, I keep referring to these embedded layers of African American history. In other words, African American history and African Americans have literally been in every aspect of San Antonio history. And so if uh, people are in a discussion or, um, uh, you know, listening uh, uh, to some uh, presentation, uh, ask a question about African American history. Black folks have been in the military. Uh, they've been cowboys. They've, of course, been in religious organizations. Uh, we haven't even talked about food culture and the African American influ influence with that. Um, education, uh, African American, early African American citizens um, couldn't get quality education in Texas because the, uh, uh, the Texas Constitution did not provide. Uh, funding for African American education. So there are some amazing stories about uh, what what African Americans have done. Uh, they actually started their own charter school. Today we would call them charter schools, and we're talking about the the 1800s. Uh, Carrie mentioned baseball and sports. Uh, again, every aspect. So if you find yourself in a discussion, you know, ask ask that question um, uh, to you know to raise the consciousness and uh, Call Deborah. Look at look at the website. Uh, we're, we're, she's right. We are going to uh, really expand uh, because we've been able to get our our digital collection started, and it's just it's just going to mushroom. We've we've already had inquiries from uh, places outside of San Antonio and outside of Texas. So, what about funding? Uh, how hard is it for? Uh, to find funding, and is that a place where we could exert some more uh, pressure to get better funding? Oh, I will speak to that. Um, we need funding, absolutely. There is not an, a um, there's not a steady funding source. We are extremely blessed to have the Kronkowski Charitable Foundation as our benefactor. And we also uh, have some smaller grants, including the San Antonio Area Foundation, but they are small grants. Our budget does not even cover probably the salary of three people at the witty. So funding, funding, funding and we need it. Uh, one of the things that you can contribute is by simply becoming a member of SACAM. We are looking for individuals, nonprofits, and also corporations to support the work that we're doing. SACAM is basically a volunteer-based organization and they work extremely hard. I wanna piggyback on what Everett said about uh, asking the question. We, you've gotta ask the question, well, what is supposed to be here? Weren't African-Americans here? Weren't Native Americans here? That question has to be asked. And if it's asked enough, then people say, you know what? We need to invest a little bit more in the research and in telling those stories. Mm -hmm. Uh, which leads to a, a question that somebody asks, is, is, is there a concerted effort to identify places that we might landmark and, and preserve? Um, and, and I can talk a little bit about that and maybe you know, uh, Everett and Carrie might want to chime in on this a bit too. Um, so um, I think that there could be a, a stronger concerted effort and I'm glad to see that there's interest in this. Uh, we, uh, I know that SACAM has identified a list of places that we think could be landmarks. Fortunately, a lot of them are already in historic districts, so they all already are protected. 
but I do think that we could do more to highlight the story. And, and, and Carrie, I'm thinking of you because I'm thinking, and actually, again, this is, this is part of SACAM. Um, SACAM is housed in a very important landmark. It's housed in the Sutton home. And, and Carrie, you know, you are very familiar with that neighborhood. You were familiar with um, that home. Uh, and we should also say, uh, we were very sad to see the state lose a building or demolish a building that it owned last year that was also related to the Sutton family. So Carrie, what, what, do you, what are your thoughts on being able to identify some of these places and ensuring that they're not demolished? That actually sounds like a good, well, two things, that sounds like a good project, a survey to actually to put out to the community uh, for people, for, for those of us who aren't familiar or some some places just we just overlooked, but to the 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 Sutton House that is such a I I think the Sutton family is not only the most accomplished family to come out of San Antonio. I think that there's a as an accomplished family that this that this country has ever produced. It's just amazing, and anything that can be done to tell their story. Uh, I mean, I think all, the, all of them, all of those, those, those kids uh, are gone now. They all live, you know, to be, to be old. But uh, I just think so much that the Sutton family, uh, when you have these, these 10, 12 dozen children who all got master's degrees and advanced degrees and, and, you, know, you have a baby who's Percy Sutton, who's the most well known, but then you have you know, the first black Supreme Court uh, justice in, in New York was a, was one of those children. And I, 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 I really, I wish someone would, would do a, a, a book, a documentary, something on, on the Sutton family. I'm so glad that the house is still there and that you can walk in the house and that you were there, you know, when back before, when it was still a funeral home you can still get the, 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 the same kind of vibes. But uh, one of my pet projects, but I don't think I ever have the time to do it, frankly, is, is telling the Sutton story. Mm -hmm. It's the story of America, but so much more. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, and I'd like to announce to everyone, the Texas Historic Commission did approve a historic marker for the now uh, demolished uh, Sutton building and it will be named after G.J. Sutton and we do talk a little bit about his history but I, I, it was so hard to write the the idea for the text marker because there is it's, it can't all fit on a marker mm -hmm. there is just so much history there and I was just so thinking that I knew the Sutton contribution, but just looking at newspaper articles at the time and seeing how much G.J. Sutton did himself in a very short time period, that in itself could be a book, you know, about G.J. Sutton in the 70s. So, um, and I'm gonna come back around to thinking about the future and, and some of these projects. But before we go uh, too much further, um, the other question that uh, I think connects the Suttons is the idea of the Woolworth building and trying to preserve the Woolworth building and, and the Suttons, you know, their involvement in uh, desegregating San Antonio and the importance of the Woolworth building to, to that story. And so the qu question is, uh, what do you think about efforts to preserve that building? Well, th this is Everett. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, back to the layers, uh, there's a couple of quick questions. Uh, SACAM is the San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum. That's, that's what SACAM stands for. And uh, the Samuel Sutton Homestead is located at 430 North Cherry at the corner of Dawson. Uh, it, it includes the, the original uh, 1896 uh, house that Samuel and Lillian built for $500. And it includes the addition that uh, GJ and uh, AC, as uh, uh, Carrie mentioned, GJ and AC uh, in, in the 40s and 50s uh, ran the Sutton Paradise Funeral Home. 
uh, uh, so we're thrilled to be, uh, you know, to be there. But uh, quickly back back to the Woolworth, um, the the young lady who wrote the letter requesting the desegregation of the lunch counters down, downtown was uh, uh, Mary Lillian uh, Andrews, and she was Samuel and Lillian's granddaughter. So that that just uh, exemplifies the legacy of civil rights work uh, in the Sutton family. But what many people don't know um, and haven't taken good stock in is that once again, there are layers of history on Alamo Plaza that are related to um, uh, the indigenous Americans. Um, if you haven't uh, been reading on the, uh, the burial sites that they've uh, been documenting on the plaza, uh, that's really significant uh, and important. Uh, but in the 1880s, uh, uh, African Americans uh, used Alamo Plaza just like everybody else uh, for uh, uh, public dis discussions, uh, civil rights discussions. And at one point, uh, there was a trial, people don't know this, but there was a trial uh, because uh, a group of African Americans was uh, physically run off of Alamo Plaza because they were trying to have a, a public discussion, uh, you know, kind of like what we're, what we're seeing in 2020. And uh, the the evidence was so clear that uh, actually the mayor, the sheriff, and uh, several uh, former city council people uh, for the city of San Antonio were indicted on conspiracy to uh, 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 take away the freedom of speech of those African Americans. So that, that civil rights legacy is right there on the plaza and it evolved uh, 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 in 1960, when uh, Mary Lillian wrote the letter asking for uh, desegregation. Uh, and so we, there's no more important civil rights landmark um, on the plaza than, than the Woolworth building. And of course, uh, you know, we know it's across the street from uh, the Alamo. And I think I could get uh, Mario in on this. Uh, many people forget that one of the reasons that the uh, defenders of the Alamo were fighting was so that they could maintain slavery and keep black people oppressed. Uh, we cannot ever forget that and um, how it connects to the, the, the evolution of civil rights in San Antonio. Yeah, if, thanks Everett, if, if, I, if I could. Um, there was a book, uh, I can't remember the name of it offhand, but in 1898 or roughly uh, around that time period, there was a mob of people chasing a African-American man right across the front of the Alamo. Uh, and later on, the author of that book, his last name was North. I think it's Robert, Robert Minor or something. So I can't remember the guy's name, um, but he said he went into a, uh, a saloon in San Antonio around that same time. And um, one of the people at the bar pull out the severed thumb of an African-American that he was keeping as a souvenir. And it may have been related to the, the black person they were running across the Alamo. And, 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 and in a San Antonio light newspaper article, I want to say dated in the 1920s or so, there was a, a Confederate soldier interviewed who actually uh, uh, remarked that slaves were sold at the top of the Alamo in 1860 one and he pointed to some stairs that used to be <clears throat> that went on the top of the long barracks is where they sold slaves uh, there. Minger Hotel also sold slaves uh, as well by appointment only and you can actually find that in some of the newspaper uh, clippings and um, and I always like to mention that Santa Ana had an all-black regiment of the, <laughs> and it was made up of uh, blacks from Havana uh, first from Africa then Havana then uh, here and who fought for Santa Ana, and not for the uh, for the Anglo slave owners at the Alamo, and, and by the way, it, it, uh, that's becoming more known. It wasn't known at all, and to even talk like I just did uh, at one point in time, people would try to run you out of town. But <clears throat> now the the, the paradigm has changed. I mean, all this stuff that's hidden, people want to hear about it, and. Um, and so we're more than happy to do that. At least I am. 
I think everybody on this page is as well, because uh, we're going to change this educational system in one way or another, and that this is an important way to, to do it. I think so, and, and even have uh, some calls here to to for this group to get together again, which I would highly advocate because we're just this is like the introduction to the even the idea of this that there, how we do this research is really important and that's one of the questions that's asked because this is about really digging into primary research the way that ever it does you know having to go look at at the brands that you can find in the bear county archives looking at documents that have not been thoroughly read through looking at deeds if this is not about secondary research and looking at books that somebody else has done you have to look at maps you have to as i said look at deeds look at the bear county archives look at newspaper articles to really begin to pull this story together and and so it would be fun to talk about that at, at some point and um i have an ending question but deborah i think you wanted to say something I, I wanted to add the interesting thing about Alamo Plaza. If you pay attention to what is happening in the uh, reconstruction of the plaza, you don't hear about what is going to happen with the storytelling of the African Americans and the natives. As a matter of fact, you will hear something that says if you keep asking the question, you won't be included in the history, the telling of that history. So I encourage you, if you would um, want to know more about this process, to contact the Texas Land Office and the Conservation Society of San Antonio. They have a lot of information on their website, exactly who you can contact to talk about making sure that the real story of the Alamo is what is told at the new Alamo Plaza. Thank you very much, Deborah. And I also want to say, and Everett, I'll come back to you, that oh, I'm seeing come up on the, the chat board of you know, distinguished scholars like Ellen Riojas Clark and, and Francis Gonzalez, and I'm so happy that they're here. Uh, and it would be great for all of us to be sitting at a table one of these days when uh, after COVID-19 and we can all talk about this uh, together. It would be fun. But Everett, uh, go ahead. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I just wanted to ask a, an ending question. And, you know, we're looking at the future, say, you know, 10, maybe even 20 years from now. Um, and you're looking at the end product, the end research of this new generation of students, some of them or students that are, are listening to this right now. What is the history that they will have completed that is, is missing now? Um, Carrie, you had mentioned the Sutton book, but is, is that, would that be your contribution or what you would envision or is there another idea you might have? No, actually, I, I more information, I mean, more dis, uh, dissemination about the Sutton family to me is very important. And then there's also one small but, but nagging thing and Everett, you and I have talked about this. If there's a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. in San Antonio, somebody, yeah show it because it's like it's one of those great that everyone has the stories of him and, and and Reverend Abernathy being here but I've never seen a, a picture or something to to document it. I agree I've I've worked with Carrie Lattimore we tried to uncover something and, and there isn't anything other than you know the, the idea the rumor of it so I, I agree. Well, that should be one that would be wonderful for the books. Everett, would you like to go next? Uh, sure. I guess for, for, for me, it would be the, uh, I, I don't ever want to hear anybody say there's no black history in San Antonio. Uh, that, that's just a myth. And uh, I would love to see uh, the younger people, uh, you know, whenever they do get together or whenever they have conversations, uh, that it's a collective conversation and, um, you know, they would feel funny if they uh, couldn't talk about all the different cultures and all the different um, layers that, you know, if somebody, you know, started off on, uh, you know, this kind of classical heroic track, somebody in the group would stop them and say, wait a minute, I know that's not true, 
because A, B, C, and we've learned better. Um, so the collective history and um, nobody would ever say there's no black history in San Antonio. Thank you. Mario? <clears throat> yeah, you know, I'd like to see um, maybe Trinity Press do 301 years of San Antonio history. Um, <laughs> and the city of San Antonio uh, to do that as well. And maybe we could encourage some of the other universities to do some of this stuff in, in printed matter and then consult with people that have the stories to tell. Um, the city ought to do that. The University, Lady of the Lake ought to do that. And Carnival Word University ought to do that. All of them ought to do that. Um, and so we can keep on going with all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Deborah? Uh, my wish is for the research to be accepted. It's one thing for us to uncover it. It's another thing for it to be shared and accepted as a part of history, like Everett was saying. It, it needs to be shared and then accepted. African-American history is history. I agree, that's great. And then I realized there's a few more questions here. Um, Everett, where can people get the hat that you're wearing? And maybe you want to explain that a little bit. Well, so the, uh, I, I mentioned in my uh, acknowledgement at, at the beginning about my grandfather. And um, he was actually a real cowboy in uh, Nacogdoches County, Texas. And when I was a child, my mom used to send me up there in the summers so to keep me out of trouble. And so my granddad taught me how to ride a horse, how to saddle and brush and care for a horse, but he had a cattle brand. And so when I started researching in uh, Bear County, um, I became curious and, uh, you know, that's what started me on this uh, trail. Uh, now I'm somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 or 76 uh, cattle brands filed by African Americans uh, between uh, 1852 and uh, World War II. Um, so I started thinking of, you know, is there any way that I could uh, kind of uh, tease or uh, get especially younger people to ask questions about this? And so um, uh, again, I used, started off with Jane Warren's, this is Jane Warren's uh, brand certificate. And uh, started putting the cattle brands on the hats and the first time i wore the the first time i wore this hat i uh, walked up to a counter and before the person took my uh, lunch order she asked me what's that funny symbol on your hat and uh, so i opened up <laughs> that opened up the uh, the opportunity so if uh, uh, somebody is interested uh, you could uh, you could email me or you could email, uh, actually, uh, Linda Fly keeps track of all this for me. And uh, we'll be happy to uh, work with you. So it's uh, rosafly122 at gmail.com. And uh, we'll see what we can do uh, for you. Great. And there are a few more questions. And I think what we'll do with that, if, if that's OK with everyone, because it is after 8 o'clock, and I want to be conscious of everyone's time, is we will follow, have some follow-up questions to um, answers to the questions that we didn't get to. So I want to thank everyone for joining us for this monthly series of the Maverick Book Club. It's a Trinity University Press series that discusses books that are shaping the landscape of Texas and San Antonio. The next installment will be Wednesday, September 9th at 7 p.m. featuring San Antonio Uncovered. Uh, the author will be in a conversation with, David, with Dave Rios. You can register now for this uh, event via the link in the chat box or at tupress.org. You'll receive confirmation, including a link and promo code to buy the book at the Special Maverick Book Club price. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, panelists. This has been great. I would really love to talk to you all night long if I could. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye.